Good morning, everybody. My name is Elke Rebach from the American Council on Germany. I um, have the pleasure of leading the Chicago chapter, and we are gathering here today for an event called E-Mobility Today, Challenges and Opportunities on Both Sides of the Atlantic. It's the first time we are hosting an event together with SITCA. Um, SITCA assembles the trade commissioners in Chicago, uh, and has uh, with that a similar reach into the international community as we do. And um, thank you first to Sipka and to Ginter Rubin for assisting with this event. Let me briefly introduce the panel because we have a great discussion ahead of us and I don't want to take up too much time um, on, uh, before we dive into that. First, we have Michael, Michael Desario. He's the president of Sportiva. Sportiva is a professional engineering consulting firm focused on mobility and autonomous vehicle technologies through technology partners. He is also a graduate of the University of Michigan. Stefan Knupfer leads McKinsey's sustainability practice in the Americas and has global responsibility for helping the firm's consultants develop sustainability expertise. He works with clients globally, including multiple recent projects in Brazil, China, Germany, and North America. As the former leader of the automotive and assembly practice and the lead partner in the firm's Detroit office, Stefan's client work centers around the automotive, aerospace, and advanced electronic sectors. Uh, we have James Schulte. Uh, James leads the Excellence Growth um, Initiative across its regulated and competitive footprint employing a lean startup approach to build new businesses that solve customer problems and help transform the utility business model. As part of the innovation team, James also works on changing the company's culture and deploying technology to boost efficiency. James is passionate about the utility of the future and making our electric power system more sustainable. Last but not least, we have Eric Tannenblatt, who is my partner uh, at Dentons in our Atlanta office. Um, he is our global chair of the public policy and um, regulatory team at Dentons. Um, Eric is a renowned lecturer and political counselor who is wildly regarded as one of the nation's prominent public policy thought leaders, has served in the administrations of three US presidents and as a senior advisor to the US Senator and Governor um, and held U.S. Senate a confirmable post, uh, post governing a federal agency. He has a passion for shepherding disruptive companies and industries through the complicated web of law and regulations, which is what brings him here today. Um, um, as, I, as I said myself, I uh, lead the Chicago chapter of the ACG. I'm also a partner at uh, Dentons together with Eric um, and recently joined the board of the ACG. So welcome everybody, we're delighted to have you. Um, let's kick it off. Let, may I first hand our conversation to Michael, uh, who as, as the co-founder of Sportiva and host of an incubator, would you talk to us about the state of the e-mobility industry generally and how it has evolved over the last six months? Yes, good morning and uh, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Alka and the American Council in Germany and, and Ginta uh, Rubin with Chicago International Trade Commissioner Association for inviting me today to be a guest speaker. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, being based in Detroit, Michigan and, and part of the Planet M Landing Zone, which is a mobility incubator, it gives really Sportiva an opportunity to be involved in many aspects of mobility. And as we all know, mobility is undergoing one of the most transformational social technological and uh, economic shifts of a generation right now. And we see a really key, three key disruptive technologies happening, electric, electric vehicles, alternative powertrains, and connected and autonomous vehicles and on-demand mobility services. Um, at the moment in, in Michigan, with the different incubators and, and technologies, we do see a lot of key focuses on autonomous vehicle testing, uh, vehicle safety, electrification. Uh, we also see mobility as a service, uh, collaboration with emerging technologies, 
and innovation centers. And I'll, and I'll go into depth a little bit more about those briefly. In regards to testing centers, here in Michigan, they did open up the American Center for Mobility, which is a one of a kind global smart city test center. Uh, it's over a 500 acre um, facility. It does uh, provide autonomous vehicle testing to any tier one or any OEM that wants to test their new technologies. It does offer um, comprehensive intelligent transportation systems, 5G network, uh, fast paced cloud services for high volume data transfer. So we're seeing that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, my, my alma mater, University of Michigan, opened up uh, M-City, which is another smart city where we see them testing, again, uh, autonomous vehicle technologies, but also other forms of mobility, last mile transportation, um, mobility shuttle services. We're seeing in the industry where the OEMs are recognizing that they don't have all that it takes on their own such as for GM and FCA. So we see a lot of collaboration happening in the industry, such as Rivian, which is the new startup electric truck company. Uh, everybody's probably seen in the industry, Ford Motor Company invested 500 million into Rivian and Amazon invested 700 million. Uh, just recently too, Nikola Motors, which is also making their own form of electric vehicle and also class seven, class eight electric full-size trucks for deliveries. Um, was in a, um, a joint venture with General Motors, who's invested in them, and in the future will supply battery technology, uh, chassis infrastructure, fuel cell systems, and provide a factory to build the new uh, fully electric pickup. And uh, we, we see now two Lucid Motors, kind of in the same scope, where they're building a full electric pickup truck, and then focus on full-size delivery trucks um, which will be the future of, of delivery systems. Um, Geely just, men, uh, just uh, debuted their new EV um, architecture in Beijing last Wednesday. And uh, now they are gonna be offering an open sourced uh, platform where any, any OEM could take advantage if they don't have the technology on their own, they, could, they can team up with Geely getting this open source EV platform. So we're seeing a lot of these these collaborations happening. I think this collaboration will continue to happen for these companies to be successful. Uh, we do see the OEMs recognizing that they do have to make their own investments, uh, such as Ford Motor Company just made a $700 million investment in their Rouge facility. They are making a major expansion on their Ford Rouge plant that will build the new fully electric Ford F-150 pickup trucks, which will be available in 2022. Um, in addition to more of the former formal transportations of mobility, we're seeing uh, mobility as a service. So especially now during COVID, where I'm sure a lot of you on the line today, it may have used the traditional services to order food or groceries, but because of the demand, uh, your groceries may have come a day or two late, or maybe your food order was canceled. Um, there was companies like Refraction AI, who has made a mobile autonomous robotic vehicle that will deliver uh, food or groceries to, to somebody's um, place of business or home. So we're, we're seeing that those forms of mobility. In addition to those forms of mobility, we're seeing um, the last mile traveled um, too. So electric scooters, which I'm sure you've seen in a lot of metropolises or, or e-bikes. Um, which has also helped during um, this, this pandemic because a lot of metropolises had to shut down busing systems due to spatial distancing. So we've seen where these forms of mobility have actually picked up the slack. Um, in addition to that, we do see the major tier ones like Lear and Bosch um, and some other folks that are opening up their own innovation centers. So their own incubators, which are strictly focused on mobility and emerging technologies. Um, I think other than that, what Sportiva also specializes in is helping our global um, clients and international tier one suppliers with their specific technology. Because of the architecture changing so dramatically and so fast, a lot of these companies are finding themselves having to develop new products uh, based on new voltages, high voltage systems, thermodynamics, 
um, and, and things like that. So that's where we come in and, and help consult and make sure they're using the right technologies, the right materials, um, and, and testing their, their products to, to meet the OEM specifications. Thank you, Michael. Um, James, would you chime in uh, based on your experience leading Excellence Growth Initiative in this field and give us your, the current funding environment? Um, how does the pandemic play into it, uh, the general economic downturn and outlook? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the, the good news for the sector is that despite uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and despite the, the global recession that we're all in, the momentum is strong enough uh, for e-mobility that we are not seeing a, a horrible downturn in the, in the funding environment. Now, that being said, there's kind of differences in, in where the dollars are flowing and where the, the, the investor and corporate communities are, are finding the attractive opportunities and putting their capital work. So, so first, on, on the positive side, as Michael was getting at, uh, there's a tremendous amount of momentum on the corporate side, right? I, I work at Exelon, a large uh, Fortune 100 utility company, and we're placing bets in e-mobility with that intersection between, uh, you know, transport and the electric power sector. Uh, all sorts of automotive companies, like, like Michael mentioned, Bosch is getting into the space. The, the large investments from the OEMs, uh, GM and Ford, uh, are, are continuing to pump dollars into the sector. And, and uh, so it's got enough staying power that, that people know it needs to be part of their capital allocation strategy. The other place where we're still seeing strong investor appetite is for the larger companies, uh, the larger startups that are, you know, Series C, D, heading towards IPO or even IPOing. Um, and in particular, recently, there's been a big boom of SPAC uh, acquisitions that have companies going public that way. ChargePoint, for instance, a, a global uh, charging uh, hardware manufacturer and network operator about to go public at a valuation of 2.4 billion via SPAC. And, and we've seen a lot of SPAC activity in the e-mobility space as well. So that's all, that's a lot of the, the positive side of the story, I would say. Um, one other piece, again, as Michael was getting at, is that it's really, it's really proliferated across mobility, right? So you think five, 10 years ago, it was really, you know, passenger vehicles, you know, light duty that, that were the focus, but now you're seeing at everything looking at it and, and the ancillary parts, right? The software, um, you know, various components of uh, the different types of mobility from scooters to class eight truck. So, so that's also helping with momentum. On the, on the challenging side, I think what we have seen is that um, venture funds are, are being conservative right now and working on kind of keeping their own portfolio um, healthy and afloat. So I think we have seen a little bit of a slowdown in kind of the series A, series B space over the past couple of months. Um, still appetite, still, still uh, interest, still exploring deals, but a little bit, a little bit more cautious uh, to understand what, what's gonna happen. And obviously for those companies at that stage, sales are so critical to, to valuation and to, to um, risk management. And so with, with the, the pandemic um, and recession, that's been something that we've looked at. So one of our startups that, that we just, uh, that we've scaled over the past year. Steer is an EV subscription startup in the DC market. And as you can imagine, um, you know, we had our, our growth plans, you know, took a little bit of a bent on that. And that's an example where I think investors are being smart about when to put capital in uh, at this point. But overall, overall strong, strong momentum here in the US uh, and in, in Germany and in Europe and, and globally as really, uh, I think, the, the, broad, the broad agreement is that this, this trend is, is here to stay, as Michael was saying. And thinking about this as the trend to stay, um, Stefan, you lead the sustainability practice and you used to lead the automotive practice for McKinsey. Uh, what do you think the overall impact and change for cities is going to be? Thank you. Okay. Um, and I actually like to build on uh, what Michael said and what James said, because um, I actually also see the same trend. I think mobility is here to stay. Um, and we see the biggest revolution kind of in transportation that we have seen over the last 100 years. Um, I think the question is kind of much more the timing. Um, I do believe it's a question kind of um, in which areas um, we will see mobility kind of advancing faster and which, what areas might be more difficult. And to be quite honest, it's changing on a daily basis. We just had a discussion 
the pandemic, obviously, we had a very strong push um, for the shared services. Now, obviously, the pandemic slows this down, but it doesn't stop it. I do believe that after the pandemic, we will go back exactly to the momentum. Just yesterday, I believe, or two days ago, there was actually an announcement from Tesla that actually said that they, would, that they will actually get um, uh, the battery costs um, by 2030, I believe, or even 2025, much earlier than what everybody expected, down to something like 50 to $60, um, which obviously, if you think about the life cycle of a vehicle, um, if you drive enough miles, then an electrical vehicle through the life cycle is already um, more affordable than a combustion engine. But if you then see if the battery costs are really coming down um, in, in a new S-curve, you see completely different momentums. So therefore, um, we at McKinsey uh, and I personally believe that we will see a significant change in mobility and it's driven primarily by technology. Um, and therefore the technology is a little bit ahead, I would say, of the regulation. I'm sure Eric will give us kind of a perfect overview what role the, uh, um, the, the regulations will play there. What I like to focus on is a little bit more because there's the situation where, where technology can drive something. There's the situation where regulation can drive something. There's actually also the situation where there's an absolutely need that you can't continue like you do at this point right now. And it's actually in all global cities because we can talk about regionally different regulations because the regulations right now, the emission regulations in the US go in a different direction than for example in Europe. Um, if you look at global cities, they have all the same issue because you have congestion um, and you do have emission. The emission level is significantly higher than the what the World Health Organization would allow us. So therefore, in, in, in theory, um, that happens in Germany, that actually individual environmental groups um, um, sue cities if they don't stop traffic, if the, if the CO2 emission actually goes up above the kind of a large level. So therefore, cities all of a sudden need to stop um, people from moving, which is obviously not a solution. So we need to find something better to lower emissions, to lower congestions. If we use future of mobility and the technology in the right way, we will find ways in cities to do so. And it's interesting because we work together with C40. For those who don't know, C40 is the largest city organization in the world, has at this point about, I think, more than 95 cities globally and about 25% of world GDP, about 900 million people live in those cities. So, and they are absolutely globally and they all actually, we didn't uh, study for them what they need to do, make the city sustainable. About 30% of the issue is the mobility. And interesting after discussions with about 30, 40 mayors, they all told us, we get all of this. Mobility is for us the most difficult uh, problem to solve because it has new technology. It needs to be an integrated solution. Just to give you the idea, if you think about, you talk about people here right now, but think about your commercial mobility. Um, uh, if, if there is more internet sales, there's more parts delivery, um, most of those vents or trucks actually are diesel at this point right now, which obviously makes it significantly more difficult in a city environment. So what we have done just recently with McKinsey, we worked with the city of Chicago and the city of Paris, and we did actually um, what we call a digital twin modeling which means we look literally kind of how three million people in Paris move today, how commercial traffic moves today. We then fast forward this through the economic development um, uh, 10 years so that we actually said what's gonna happen in 2030. And we can do this, I'm not making this up, we can do this on a street level. We can actually simulate on our laptops then at the end of the day, uh, not laptops, but on our computers actually, um, we can simulate kind of how people in Paris, how people in Chicago move. And then we can apply about 45 different um, mobility solutions. And the mobility solutions are all the ones actually that I mentioned, but they're also very simple ones that you only do night delivery. Or you have actually urban consolidation centers at the outside of the city. So everybody who lives in the city can be on the electric. If you actually do this, you get an understanding for cities, what cities need to do. So we developed this Paris, there's even a report, a, a strategy for 2030, which helps not only Paris, but actually helps the private investors, because the biggest issue is <clears throat> if the cities don't make very clear what they need, then lastly, the private investors can't match. Now, the cities don't have the technology and the money, but, but they actually have the citizens who need to live there. So you need to make this matching process. And I think that's what we're trying to solve in a city environment as quickly as possible. 
Thank you, Stefan. Um, going over to what actually makes all of that possible, um, let, uh, let us turn to Eric, uh, who is our public policy expert, and have Eric speak to what the regulatory framework is at the moment, what impediments are and what still needs to happen to get to what everybody else uh, wants to get to on this panel. Well, thank, thank you, Ilka. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to join Michael, James, and Stefan, and I uh, agree with uh, everything that they said. Uh, mobility uh, touches all levels of government. And in terms of um, probably challenges, uh, probably w the biggest challenge that I would say as it relates to the government regulatory environment is a lack of understanding by the people that have to make the laws. Uh, technology is moving so fast and you have a number of lawmakers regardless of whether they're at the local state or federal level that uh, just don't understand so it really is going to be incumbent upon the private sector uh, to really help educate and you see across not just the United States but across the globe there are certain jurisdictions that are much more advanced than others and I think that over time uh, you'll start seeing uh, new forms of mobility pop up uh, across the globe. Um, you know, at the local level, uh, you know, micro mobility uh, sort of hit, hit, you know, became on the scene, uh, you know, a few years ago, everything from scooters to uh, electric bikes. Um, we've, we've been dealing with ride sharing and uh, regulatory challenges surrounding ride sharing. Um, but I think every mode of transportation has a regulatory hurdle that they need to uh, overcome. Um, it, getting to a, a little bit more broader level, uh, I'd say the national government, um, I think you're starting to see more and more governmental entities uh, recognize that EVs uh, represent the future. Again, driven by the private sector, you could just see what the OEMs are doing and the investment that's being made uh, in electric vehicle technology. And uh, I think it was mentioned by one of the earlier speakers, the decline in the price of uh, batteries. And not only is the price is going down, but the technology itself is improving and cars can go a much greater distance. So you're seeing uh, governmental bodies uh, really focusing on the need for uh, EV infrastructure because you know we can't have a successful market if we don't have the infrastructure in place to support it. So there's incentives that are being put in place to build out EV infrastructures, the federal government's providing grant money to local governments uh, to build out EV infrastructure. Um, and you're also seeing as it relates to electric vehicles, a role that government's playing is uh, providing incentives, uh, whether it's tax incentives for people to purchase an electric vehicle, you've seen states and the federal government provide tax incentives. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of states do that to stimulate the market. And then once you see a certain market share, they then sunset those tax incentives. Um, but you're still seeing a lot of that. Uh, you're also you know, seeing environmental regulations. Probably uh, in the United States, the one that stands out is the um, uh, the CAFE standards and the, the emission standards and how the current administration in Washington is rolling back the standards yet California is, is stepping forward saying we're going to maintain our standards and so you have a debate going on there uh, but again that's going to drive the market into electric vehicles um, and uh, I just want to touch a little bit too about uh, autonomous vehicles because I think all of this is related I, I believe in, uh, that electric vehicles is really uh, sort of the step to where we're going to be moving towards uh, or autonomous fleet vehicles uh, across the country, and, and I would say uh, globally. Um, you know, historically, uh, the federal government here in the United States regulates the car, and state governments regulate the drivers. And when you talk about autonomous technology, the car is the driver. So that poses uh, somewhat of a dilemma. And what you're seeing right now as it relates to autonomous vehicles 
is we have this patchwork of laws and regulations around the country. Uh, 30 to 40 states have passed legislation, most of it dealing with autonomous vehicle testing, but we've yet to see the federal government take action. Uh, two years ago, it looked like the Congress was gonna pass federal autonomous vehicle legislation. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't pass before the new Congress was elected. There was a little bit of momentum, but then you have special interests that get involved. And right now the, the impediment with a democratic house has been the, uh, the, the clout of the trial lawyers and plaintiff's attorneys. And so unfortunately we're about to conclude this next session of Congress or the, this current session of Congress and with no autonomous vehicle legislation. So we're still stuck with this patchwork of, of legislation uh, around, around the state. Um, the, the last thing I want to say, and then we could, I know we want to move to, to questions, is I think you're going to hear a lot more uh, about co-mobility in, in the days and, and months to come. And what I mean by co-mobility is the integration of all modes of uh, transportation, from micro-mobility to ride sharing to uh, buses, trains. Um, I think, you know, we're going to move to uh, a situation where people are going to pull out their uh, their app, their phone, their, their smartphone, they're going to hit an app and they're going to put in where they want to go. And based on GPS, it's going to tell the person what's the most efficient way to get from point A to point B. And it may uh, require you using multiple modes of transportation. You may have to walk somewhere to get a bus, to get to the train or to uh, get into a ride sharing vehicle. Um, and it's all going to be charged uh, with, you know, you put your credit card in this app. Uh, I think we're going to move to that. And I think that there'll be some regulatory hurdles involved uh, as we gravitate towards more co-mobility. There's a lot of exciting things that are, that are happening right now. And I do think just before I, I stop with, I, just to touch on COVID, uh, things did slow down a bit on COVID, but I think it did open up some eyes to, uh, to some of the technology challenges we face in the country. And it, it really, uh, I think, manifested itself with broadband access and education. When you had students that were forced to have to connect to their teachers at home or college students. Um, and most people focus in on rural areas and saying that we don't have broadband access in rural areas, which is very true. But I think it was also discovered that we have parts of our urban centers that don't provide uh, broadband access and, sure and access to uh, you know, the tools that are necessary uh, for education really put a punctuation mark on the importance of, of technology. And I just mentioned that because I think that uh, bleeds over into uh, mobility. And I think the government, uh, as we saw with the CARES Act that passed in the United States, was willing to spend $4 trillion uh, to provide relief and stimulus. And I think they're going to be, uh, you know, uh, appropriating additional dollars in the future. Um, and I think that's all good for the mobility sector. Let me, um, let me take a moment to follow up on uh, one thing you just touched on. We received a viewer question which picks up your, uh, your comments on what this will look like in the future. Um, the question is, uh, since car ownership for Gen Z and beyond uh, is expected to be completely different from previous generations, do you think this will drive a trend for e-car fleets um, in, in cities um, like there is one for scooters now? Uh, I don't know if, Eric, you want to take that. I'm sure others will want to chime in as well. Uh, let's open that up for discussion. I, I, I totally agree. And look, there's a decrease. You've already seen the stats that there's a decrease in personal car ownership. I think younger generations don't want to own a car, especially if you live in an urban center. And I think we're going to find that overall personal car ownership is going to continue to decrease. And I actually believe uh, there's a, some of you may be familiar with Tony Saba, the uh, Stanford professor who runs a think tank called Rethink X. He said that by the year 2030, 95% of road uh, miles traveled is gonna be in an autonomous fleet vehicle. Uh, it may not be 2030, but I don't think he's that far off. And I think what you saw with ride sharing early on 
is ride sharing was sort of the precursor to this notion of autonomous fleet vehicles traveling around the city. And again, you're going to pick out, pull out your smartphone, hit a button, and a vehicle is going to come pick you up. What that would mean is if you don't have personal car ownership, uh, it's going to mean repurposing parking decks and parking lots. You know, we'll, we, we could have more green space or more room for economic development. And I think it was Stefan who talked about the fact that battery technology is becoming so much cheaper. The lifespan of an electric vehicle is much greater than the lifespan of a combustible engine vehicle. So if you have autonomous fleets of electric vehicles traveling around that can go up to a million miles, um, I just think that's going to be uh, the future. And I would not be surprised if, you know, there, look, you'll always have a certain segment of the population that will want to have a vehicle. Um, but I think that we're going to move to a society where uh, we're going to become more dependent uh, on fleets than personal car ownership. Stefan, I saw your hand go up. Let me, let me add the next question because it dovetails nicely and I'm sure you can respond to both of those thoughts. We're getting a lot of questions, so I want to make sure we get as many in there as we can. Um, both Eric and James brought up the implications of COVID. One thing that we're seeing is that car sales are up at the moment as people are reluctant to take public transportation. Uh, this is true in places like Washington, D.C. Will the trend of personal car ownership continue to go down despite the pandemic? I wanted to add this aspect to our conversation of fleets since it plays into that. I apologize for cutting you off, Stefan. No, don't, 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 don't worry. Actually, it's, it's interesting because if you would ask um, uh, the sum of all automotive manufacturers, they would say that obviously people will buy more cars. Um, and it's obviously their business model. And I think barely one has actually a business model where they say people will buy less cars. So, and then the other thing is, um, if you look at a little bit closer, about 50% of those cars are planned to be sold in cities. Now, I just said earlier that cities already have a problem. If you have more people moving into cities, um, you have more of this problem of emission and congestion. And if you just actually sell more cars, that's also not going to work. So, so I think that's one thing. Yes, I do believe at one point. But on the other side, it's also in very different states because um, if you are in rural areas in the US, you, you will still rely on your car because you do not have any other public transportation. Very different in our cities. Next thing is, if you are the first generation in China that actually has more money, then you actually very interested first obviously in living standards in, in obviously in your apartment, how you live, in education, but very quickly the next thing it becomes to gets into cars and owning a car. Very different obviously with generation Y and, and so on in, in Europe and North America. So I do believe, as I said earlier, you have to differentiate between cities, what you can do and not. There is one thing that I would like to highlight because I hear this always on the mobility side. I completely agree with Eric. Um, I think my connection is unstable. Um, I do believe um, uh, that we will need integrated mobility because what wasn't before, we had an issue on EVs that we actually couldn't buy EVs. They are not other than the Tesla, not very attractive vehicles. Now you have enough. Now, the next thing will happen is actually now how do we charge? Because if you're not having a garage at home and you're public parking, it's a little bit more difficult than in cities. Next thing is obviously what's going to happen to the grid. So I'm just saying you need integrated solutions. That's the next thing. One thing I want to highlight in the next um, is on this integrated mobility and on the case that, that might actually introduce electric autonomous connectivity shared. Um, Everything, electric connectivity shared, is already there. The technology is there, all those different things. You can apply all of them today, and you will actually get better solutions. The autonomous is actually a little bit, you can actually do mobility with and without autonomous. Um, and I think it's important if we talk about EVs, it has nothing to do with autonomous. You can do this with, um, you can actually do EVs without autonomous. If you talk about shares, you can do it with, with or without autonomous. 
I think it's important because the autonomous is something on the technology side, on the regulation side, which we believe is going to come, but it might actually come to a later point. It might not actually be in two years, it might be not in five years. I don't know. I'm just saying I don't know. All the other ones we can actually, like, actually implement today. And therefore, me, for me, it's very important people mix a little bit the future of mobility with autonomous. I think autonomous is a specific, very important technology, um, but there is many, many other dimensions of integrated mobility, the way Eric and everybody else has actually explained it. Let us uh, switch gears just a little bit. We've received uh, several questions, and I had it on my list of questions too, on infrastructure. So if you think about the electric grid and e-vehicles, uh, the e-vehicles all depend on the uh, grid systems, which are already stressed. Um, is, who is working on improving those? Is anyone working on improving those? Um, what, what are your thoughts on the state of affairs on that end and what needs to happen? So if, if I might take that as the, <clears throat> as the representative of the utility industry on the call, uh, <laughs> it is a, it's of critical importance to the whole sector. Um, and there's, there's, Upside and there's downside to it for for utility companies. The upside, obviously, is that uh, that we can continue that we can provide uh, a service to our customers and communities that will become that much more important as transportation comes on the grid. The downside, obviously, is that it's one thing for us today. You know, we all need our our electricity so that our Wi-Fi stays on. But then you imagine adding to that that your Wi-Fi is out and your fridge is out and your car is out. Um, and so the, you know, the, the standards by which we need to ensure reliability for customers goes from already a very high bar to an almost perfect bar. Uh, and as we know, you know, the, the marginal cost to get perfection is, is high. Um, it's expensive. And, and a lot of uh, us in Exxon in particular and our utilities are very focused on affordability and equity, right? Like we could make the grid perfectly reliable uh, and it would be too expensive for you know, so many of our customers in, in cities who, who live below, uh, you know, the, the median income level. So it's a, it's a critical thing. I think how, how the, the broad industry, not just utilities, are, are looking at it are, you know, what are the digital tools that, that enable us to be smarter about the investments that we're making and manage the grid in, in real time with all of the grid connected assets, um, not just EVs, but also battery storage and, and uh, solar and uh, and IOT devices and everything. So that, that's one. Um, and then the second is that, you know, whether, where, wherever you are, there's, there's extra ways to enhance reliability and might be ways to, to do things more cost effectively depending on where you're at. So for instance, you know, Tesla's working on doing integrated solar and battery storage at their DC fast charging uh, supercharging stations, right? That's a way to self supply your, your power and your reliability needs um, and still have the grid as a backup. And so, all of us are looking at all these different tools, physical tools, digital tools, to find ways to increase uh, reliability, but do it affordably uh, and not, not overly gold plate things, um, uh, but still, still provide customers what they need. Again, the investment in the grid and smart grid and all of that, that's all happening, period, and, and making gains. But you, you look at some areas in uh, you know, Northern California with high EV penetration, uh, it can be, you know, they're quickly, you're getting to extra upgrades needed. So we, we all have to be creative in, in what are the, what are the most cost effective solutions that also enable that future proofing, right? Because that's the other thing is that it's not just today. It's, you know, what are the investments we're making today, but in two years when there's more EVs, five years and 10 years, right? What are the, what are the things that are flexible and allow for us to add more as we go? Hey, Elka, can I just add to, can I just add to that? Uh, Cause I think the government plays a key role in uh, building out the EV infrastructure. Uh, and you're, you're seeing that it, right now in, in uh, cities where new commercial development, when they're approving the zoning, they're requiring that EV infrastructure be put in. And you're starting to see uh, even states incentivizing rural communities to put in along highways, uh, EV infrastructure. Uh, so there's a lot of resources coming from the government as well as uh, regulatory requirements to build out the infrastructure to meet the demand. Thank you. Um, Eric, while I have you unmuted, um, 
would you give us your thoughts on the um, outcome of the election and how possible outcomes might affect might affect the industry? Well, I mean, as you can see, the Trump administration has rolled back a lot of the regulations. And I used the example earlier about California. California is still proceeding with their emissions uh, regulations. And, uh, you know, that's going to require, uh, you know, more EVs. Um, you know, depending, it's not just what, what happens with the presidential election. I mean, you also have control of the Congress that is, um, you know, questionable right now. But as I use the example of autonomous vehicle legislation, when the Republicans controlled the House and the Senate, they were moving forward with autonomous vehicle legislation and it stalled in the Senate because the way our political system uh, is set up, you have to have 60 votes to, to get a bill to advance in the Senate, and they could never uh, get that far. It got out of committee, but it never passed the floor. Um, you know, it is true that there are certain special interests that uh, have more influence over the two parties. So, uh, you know, depending on who controls the, the Congress uh, in the White House will determine um, you know, what kinds of regulations will be put in place or what kind of legislation will be put in place. I would think if President, if Vice President Biden got elected, you're going to see some of the Biden, uh, Obama era regulations that were rolled back, put back in place. And some of that was very favorable towards enhancing um, EVs. Although I don't think people are just buying EVs now just because of the environment. I think it's now uh, fair to say that people are buying EVs because of the overall uh, efficiencies. And as the costs, as we've talked about, keep coming down, that will be a, a real uh, motivator. Thank you. Um, question for um, everybody in the group um, from the audience. Uh, cultural differences on both sides of the Atlantic are significant in regard to both public transit and shared mobility. How do you think these trends will develop in Europe and North America? Uh, if I may start, uh, from what I've seen with working with our, our global clients and I'm sure the other guest speakers too, in traveling abroad, I have seen at least the European Union uh, be a little bit more active in as far as the regulations and pushing for uh, EVs, as Stefan even mentioned earlier on the calls. I think as, as the more and more EV companies come online and more collaborations come online in North America, and as infrastructures get built up to support it and kind of take away the, the range, range anxiety, as they call it, um, as we see the technologies on the batteries are, are increasing the range of these vehicles, but also once you increase the range of these vehicles, you still have to have the infrastructure in place. I think that uh, European countries have, have kind of got a head start on, on North America in that aspect of building out their, their EV infrastructure. Uh, if you if don't mind, I, I can't agree with Michael. Um, I would just also highlight um, what I said earlier, because you see significant differences, I believe, now you said it, between the federal government, the state governments, the city governments in the US. Um, you see a little bit of significant more consistency, I would say, on those different levels in Europe. Um, and I think that's exactly why it feels like that Europe is kind of a little bit more organized. And then interesting enough, if you think in China, um, you obviously have a very much a top-down kind of um, uh, determination what's going to happen. Um, uh, and you see, for example, up to about two years ago, 50% of all EVs worldwide were actually Chinese um, uh, EVs because the Chinese government said we're going to leapfrog the combustion engine. We will never be able to compete. Um, the second thing is then on the other side, that's what I said earlier, interesting enough, there is not such a big difference, um, cultural difference between global cities in the world. They all behave the same. They all have the same issue. They, if you just think about the numbers in global cities, um, more than 60% of world population lives in cities and it's growing. 
um, 70% of CO2 emission is in cities. 80% of world GDP is in cities. Um, if you look at technology, all those different things, it actually, from educational level, it comes actually from cities. So the point is, if you don't change anything in cities, you're not going to change the world. And given that the cities have all these problems on the mobility side, I'm very optimistic that the cities will push us, regardless of what state and, 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 and um, federal government decisions might mean, and the technology will move us forward. So therefore, I see all of this a little bit kind of a slowdown or something like this, but in the bigger scheme, it's very clear, I think, what we all agree, kind of this, this future mobility is going to move forward. And if we do it right, it's going to be actually a very positive thing because it will allow people to move significantly better, exactly like Eric was describing. On your app, it's going to tell you kind of how much it costs and how fast you go and what is the impact on the environment and things like this. Um, and on the other side, if we do it in a very uncontrolled way, what is happening right now, we see all those scooters hanging around and we see kind of ride-sharing companies in addition to taxis taking people out of public transportation and subways. And that's obviously that's something that cities have to stop, so we're going in the wrong direction. But in long term, I think we're going to figure this out. But I do believe the public sector, the private sector need to figure out better together. And I think Eric said it right at the beginning, the private sector needs to help the public sector to figure out how this works. If they only go with their short-term, next one or two years, revenue ideas, buy my product, we're not going to get into the right solution. Let me um, pick up on Stefan's point about the role of government. We have a viewer question on gas tax. Uh, if we move to more e-mobility, how will governments replace revenue from the gas tax? Um, I, I think I probably am best equipped to uh, start, but you know, welcome uh, others' thoughts too. Uh, that's a real problem because the gas tax has been uh, a primary source for transportation funding for a lot of states. And as you... Um, you know, the, the questioner asked, I mean, if you move to uh, electric vehicles. So what some states have done, I'll, I'll give you an example. The state of Georgia uh, actually now charges a flat fee for electric vehicle owners, um, which I thought was short sighted on their point on their part personally. But their view was that if you're an electric vehicle uh, user, you're using the roads. And if the gas tax is funding the roads, you need to pay your fair share. So they have a flat fee that when you renew your um, tag each year, you have to pay, uh, pay that fee. But as we move towards more electric vehicles, there's gonna need to be other revenue streams uh, to replace that gas tax because the gas tax won't be there. And as long as that is a primary funding source for transportation, in particular roads and bridges, uh, it's gonna become a real problem. And to uh, Stefan's, uh, you know, I think he was um, highlighting a point I made earlier. It's a great example of how the government is just thinking, uh, you know, one, two years ahead of themselves. And, you know, they're, they, they, I, I know a state where they increased their gas tax because they needed to make road improvements. Uh, and what they did, they didn't realize that, okay, you increase it, but more people are starting to buy electric vehicles. So it's so short-sighted. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a place where I think the private sector really needs to highlight and point out to policymakers that they have to be looking at the long game uh, and you know, filling out revenue sources is gonna be a real problem. One, one last thing too, states also become very dependent on the highway trust fund from the federal government to fund transportation projects. And that is uh, running out of money as well. So not only are, will you not get the gas tax at the uh, state level because of the increase in EVs, but you also have the compounded challenge of less federal revenue in the highway trust fund. So we're going to need to come up with another revenue source. Did I see others itching to chime in on that? I think so. I was just going to say, as, as someone who believes in EVs and drives an EV, you know, it, it also... It, and I think this is the other interesting thing, right? When it's not just policy in an abstract way, right? It affects us in, at the individual level. So when I was getting my EV and needing to pay a registration fee for it, right? That was 
something that was uh, frustrating because it was more expensive than it would be otherwise. I understand obviously other pieces, but it's that it's that human level of what's happening, right? And where governments want to incentivize, uh, you know, decarbonization of the transportation sector for all of those benefits, right? What are the how do you how do you achieve uh, multiple ends that you're trying to funding revenue sources, but also not not creating, you know, too high of barriers or inadvertent barriers. Talking about barriers, James, one we had in our initial conversations to get ready for this panel, uh, we had talked about the use of data, the availability of data and the use of data, the sharing of data. Um, do you want to explain the, the, the issue a little bit and um, think where, where, those, where that's going to take us? Yeah, sure. And I think, you know, Stefan, Michael, others jump in too here as well. Um, but uh, the, the opportunity and the challenge right now in the, in the data space as, we, as more progress is being made is, you know, all of these devices are throwing off um, tons and tons of data. And in order to, uh, in order to really, I think, to, to break through some of these step functions as we're driving things further, um, getting good data, being able to organize it, uh, being able to make it available and share it uh, along with uh, managing privacy concerns is going to be important. Uh, again, depending on the use case, right? But Stefan talked about how people are moving in cities, right? That's a lot of personal private data, but as you're designing where the infrastructure should go or how you want to price things, uh, you know, where is it expensive to, what, what forms of transport are expensive or not, or are taxed or not, depends a lot on, on good uh, real-time data and, and visibility into that and forecasting as well. Uh, you know, then you look on the, you know, the fleet side of things in the, the medium and heavy duty space, um, you know, a, as fleets are changing over, there's questions on, you know, how are they understanding their own fuel consumption as they're still diesel moving to electric. Uh, they're charging, you know, having a full picture of their operational costs and being able to plan for that. That's a complex data challenge. Uh, as well. So it's, it's a big, it's an issue that a lot of startups are trying to attack. A lot of people in the space are trying to attack. Um, and again, I think, I think the industry has learned from other industries that have gone through these digital transformations um, and hopefully is learning from it to try to, to try to put things into place at the outset that will enable uh, forward progress instead of, you know, realizing five years from now, shoot, we didn't, we didn't have the infrastructure we needed to, to make smart decisions and, and give people that visibility. It's an increasingly a topic, back to Eric's stuff, you know, public advocates are bringing it up as well. The consumers and businesses need access to their data to make smart decisions too. So uh, I think not, you know, not any silver bullets to it right now, but a, a hot topic uh, that we're focusing a lot on. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with James. Uh, some of the other aspects of data we're seeing is, even with the, the companies that are de developing these new systems that are collecting the data, uh, a lot of them at first were kind of keeping it really close to their chest because they realized this is going to be a technology that will bring value that they could offer uh, a lot of companies now seeing that they do have to do a collaboration with data. And the other aspects of, of the data too is who's going to own the data. So is the consumer going to own the data? Is the OEM going to own the, uh, the data or is the tier one, uh, for example, from the telematics co company who, who created the infotainment system that allows these different devices to connect, to exchange the data. Are they going to own the data? So there's been a lot of different topics uh, in regards to data, both in traditional vehicles, EV vehicles, and then the topics actually change once you get to autonomous vehicles, because now there's different types of data being collected. So not only personal data, but now there's sensor data, LIDAR data, radar data, and that's a big task because they have to go in and, and they actually actually have to start labeling in each individual data, uh, data point. You know, if it recognizes a stop sign or if it recognizes a pedestrian versus a versus an animal. Um, so that's that's been a big challenge in the automotive space too. Just looking ahead at autonomous vehicles and how they're handling the exchange of data and collecting data. And, and, and I only want to add, I think there's a big difference, obviously, because we talk about both sides of the Atlantic, a big difference how the Europeans think about data privacy. Um, then obviously, as we do at this one in the US, the second thing is, I do believe the issue of cybersecurity is something that's looming over us 
Um, and like always, we all aware of it, but we are not going to be able to solve it until something really happens. And then I think we're going to jump on it, but it's actually unsolved. Um, and then I do believe in European cities, it's a little bit clearer that governments, cities, and so on, will not allow a third party to own the data, how their citizens are moving around and how goods are moving around in the city. Um, I think in the US, it's a little bit more open, I think, the discussion, but I think in Europe, I think in China, it's, it's in, in many countries, it's relatively clearer that kind of who owns the data, regardless of who generates the data. Thank you. And we just um, received a follow-up question on uh, the privacy question that you raised, uh, Stefan. Um, do you think that this might present an opportunity for alignment um, since... Um, I'll, I'll just leave it as an open question to you. Do you think this is an opportunity for alignment on how data, uh, data privacy gets treated on both sides of the Atlantic? No, I'm actually on the spot here. <laughs> uh, so oh, sorry. <laughs> and, also, and, also, and also it depends, obviously, where you're talking about what you're talking about. So alignment between, obviously, every challenge is kind of an opportunity, number one. So therefore, yes, there is an opportunity for alignment. Um, I think there are a lot of opinions right now. And I think the other thing is, if you think about how many um, in constituents actually are in there, how many stakeholders are involved, you can talk about alignment between private companies and actually how they share data. You can talk about kind of individuals and how they actually share the data. And we see a big significant difference if you open up right now an internet page, they, every single time they ask you if you agree on it and they make it actually relatively complicated if you don't agree. <laughs> but it, it more and more people, I believe, are saying, I don't want to actually my data be shared. And I think you will have differences there. But I think even more important, I do believe we need to find solutions also internationally. We see obviously kind of some challenges there, kind of how the European Union kind of um, reacts on it um, with other places in the world. Um, and then the other one is between, again, between public and private companies. So there are, there, there are multiple levels, uh, uh, levels that we actually need to work. I do believe it will be one of the most challenging tasks. So there's opportunity, but I don't think it's going to be easy. Sure. Um, thank you. I was going to go back to one point that was raised at the very beginning of our conversation. Um, and that's the, the, the opportunity for cooperation between the startups and the existing uh, big automotive companies. Um, is that cooperation a shortcut, um, a shortcut of the R&D need that otherwise the traditional corporations would need to, do, need to make or R&D investment? Yes. Yes, in most cases, um, the, the larger OEM companies are recognizing if they see an emerging technology, if they would have to make the investment on their own or bring in even the expertise on their own, it would take them much longer to bring it to market. So they see the opportunity to collaborate with somebody that has already created this emerging technology to either join forces with them or even possibly license their technology. As, as you even saw when Elon Musk first um, launched Tesla, he said that he was gonna uh, license, have the opportunity to license many of his technologies to a, whoever wanted to do that and for that reason. Uh, so we, we see a lot of collaboration happening uh, with, the, I, I think we'll continue to see uh, the collaboration happen. I think the traditional OEMs see that they can't be experts at everything. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, since this is a conversation hosted by the American Council on Germany and Sitka, and of course the automotive industry is of great importance to both Germany and the United States, um, is e-mobility and the move towards autonomous vehicles an area where there could be greater transatlantic cooperation? Stefan, you probably have the best answer given you've worked with automakers on both sides of the Atlantic. My, my humble thought is that yes, it, it can and 
should be, but there's also competition there between Mercedes and uh, <laughs> Tesla, as we know. So, but you're seeing newer joint ventures too, such as Volkswagen and Ford joining forces on EVs. So that could be a continued collaboration in the future, potentially on, on autonomous too. Yeah, I, I agree. So I think that you will see a lot of partnerships and I think uh, Michael, you already mentioned it and Change mentioned it, but you see a lot of partnerships because what happens right now in automotive is on the one side, the industry has been for a very long time an industry that most of them actually have not earned their cost of capital now and they have the ups and downs. It's very difficult right now. It's actually a little bit more, again, more difficult because of COVID and, and anyway, it was actually after 2009-10 always kind of growing and it was clear that they go into recession. Now the other thing is that you need to therefore find a way to reduce cost and actually generate more profit because those new technologies require you to make enormous investments, unbelievable investments. And the other thing is because it's very, and you don't want to become the commodity. It's not that actually somebody says, you know what, the car is not important anymore. It's because in an autonomous vehicle, what's the difference between a luxury brand and a volume manufacturer as long as it's safe and drives actually reasonable and you're probably not speeding around corners with the autonomous vehicle. So therefore, the whole differentiation factor is important. So they don't know which of the technologies they need actually to own and needs to be core, which one they have. So they partner a lot. I think that's actually right. Um, and, and they are absolutely at a point. And therefore, it would be wonderful, I think, if... if West, not only Germany and the US, but actually the Western, Western, Western European or Europe and the US would actually be aligned. Um, it would help them actually on the platforms, it would help them on technologies and all those different things. Um, and there is obviously also the whole thing made about if some of other countries steal technology and steal know-how, so therefore even more. And I'm getting now in very kind of political discussions, but it would actually be very important that the that the Western world actually sticks together, not only on mobility, but I think on other topics. <laughs> you touch upon, Stefan, the, um, the, the opportunity here to put a multinational framework around this. Um, I, I think that this area in particular is one where um, that is the case, because you can not only, you can combine many, many objectives um, it's incredibly difficult to do, but the cooperation that we talked about uh, over the last hour was, uh, was, was within the industry. If you take this up to the government level, um, you could uh, set goals for um, or environmental goals as well as technology goals and protect your industries, to, to your point. Um, I, I would hope that Eric is answering this question and not me. Uh, well, what I'll say to that is that that's a very political question, Elka, and in, in, in theory it sounds Forgive great. Me. But, but <laughs> as, you, as, you, uh, as you, everyone has probably seen, whether it's dealing with climate change or intellectual property uh, issues, um, you know, different policymakers in different countries have very strong opinions. And, sure. you know, and you could just look at, you know, President Trump and pulling out of the Pir uh, Paris Climate Accord. I mean, that, that's just a great example. So there's a, there's a lot of political challenges uh, ahead of us. And intellectual property is something that, you know, in the United States is a huge priority for not just President Trump, but a lot of the leaders uh, in Congress. And, you know, protection of uh, trade secrets and IP is, is huge. In fact, I'm sure some people that follow the automotive sector know that there's a huge uh, uh, trade secret theft case between two EV battery manufacturers, between LG Chem and SK Innovations. And so, um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of political challenges involved here. Yeah, and I think it's also very challenging actually to put out regulations in an industry that is so innovative and is actually very unclear where the innovation goes and you could be, history shows this, if you regulate the wrong thing, you kind of set the wrong incentives and things like this. 
So therefore, it is just important that you figure out what are you trying to solve for. And if it's about CO2, if it's about safety, if it's about whatever you want to solve for, we have to get an agreement and then actually say, this is actually what I'm trying to incentivize. Um, and then you need to actually companies and technology compete for it rather than that you regulate kind of industries that you want. All right, we're coming up towards the end of our time. We have over the last hour touched on a, a good number of topics. Is there anything that our speakers would like to share um, and talk about that we have not touched upon before we come to a close? Any final thoughts? I, I may be gonna stop here because I really think you guys have done a terrific job to put this panel together because I do believe that the mobility, the future of mobility is a very integrative side. And you see kind of Michael from the technology side that is actually driving. You see James obviously kind of on the investment side and also I think from the, um, uh, from the energy side. And I do believe that's a typical example where the, the moment the energy providers actually start understanding how mobility really works because a lot of them have EVs in their mind, and on the other side, they say there's oil and gas on the other side. It's much more complicated. So the more you can actually change them, that's a specific example. And I do believe exactly as, as Eric was saying, I think we need to find a way that we actually get the public and the private sector actually together, because the public sector needs to learn from the private sector. I think just this discussion was terrific for me because I already kind of learned from all the other ones. So I think big congratulations. Um, Okay, to you and I think to AIG to put this panel together and, and I, think, I think it was a great combination to show how it needs to do across and we have to do this across industries. Well, thank you, Stefan. Um, I have no closing words after your very kind remarks. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. Thank you, James, Stefan. Uh, Michael and Eric for your time. Uh, thank you, Steve in New York, for hosting us and for giving us the space to do this. Um, we're delighted to be contributing uh, to the ACG from Chicago. It's our, our humble contribution. The audience for joining. We know that the offering in webinars is just about overwhelming at the moment. So we're delighted that we were able to grasp your attention. Um, and we look forward to having you soon.